Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. My name's Harold Winter, and I'm the pastor here at Cross Point Community Church. It's a del- delight to welcome you here who are present in this room. Welcome to those of you who are joining us through technology. We're glad that you can connect with us this way. And we're looking forward to the day when uh, you can be here in person. Hopefully that's able to, you're able to do that someday soon. Let's begin our service by standing, and we'll hear from Psalm 34, God's call to worship. Please rise. I sought the Lord. I looked for the Lord, and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. Let's continue worshiping God. We'll sing, God, we sing your glorious praise.
God gives you his greeting saying grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, from Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And together we say, Amen. please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we can experience grace through every generation. We're immensely thankful for all the different generations represented here in this room and connected to us through technology. We're really thankful for the way that your word transforms us and connects us to you and to each other. We're thankful for your covenant of grace. We're thankful for your deep, deep love for us. We're thankful for the difference that it makes in our lives, in our hearts, in our future, in our imagination. We pray that in this worship service, we can be strengthened in our faith and in our hope and in our love for you and for the people around us. Hear our prayer and answer us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Behold the Lamb.
The songs that we sang have a lot of imagery from the Lord's Supper. Last week we talked about baptism and how the water of baptism symbolizes the washing away of our sin and of our guilt. Today we talk about the Lord's Supper and how the bread is a reminder of Jesus' body and how the grain from a piece of bread like this was gathered from many hills and brought into one piece of bread. So the church of Jesus Christ is brought from all over the world and pulled together into one family. What does the cup make us think of? What color was the stuff that we poured into there? Do you, did you see what color that was? Nope. <laughs> what color is it, Barrett? It's red. Why is it red, do you think? It's like a grape juice. Exactly, it is grape juice. The grape juice... And the redness of the grape juice reminds us of Jesus' blood and how at the cross, Jesus' blood was shed. And Jesus' blood covers over, washes away, makes us clean from all the wrong stuff that we've ever done or thought or said and washes it completely away so that you, we, get made clean and holy just like Jesus is. The grape juice reminds us as well that we're grafted into Jesus as the vine. It's an image from the gospel according to John in which Jesus says that he is the vine and we are all the branches. And we're wild branches. On our own, we grow all sorts of weird and wonderful, not always wonderful ways, but weird ways anyhow. But when we get grafted into Jesus Christ, his sap goes through us, just like the, the juice that we drink goes in and it makes us alive. That sap makes us alive and makes us bear good fruit. And that good fruit is stuff that we do that shows our love for God, stuff that we do and say and think that shows our love for the people around us. Because those are the greatest commandments, right? People that have been washed clean by Jesus' blood in baptism, people that are connected with Jesus through the, the bread and the cup of the Lord's Supper, are to live holy lives. But what does that look like? The first and the greatest commandment is what? What's the first and greatest commandment? Yeah, hear it. Believing is really important. But the commandment actually talks about loving God, right? With all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. What's the second commandment that's like it? To love our neighbor as our... Yeah, you were going to say something, Amy? Exactly, that's right. To love your neighbor as yourself. And that's, as we see that happening in our lives, we recognize that we're changing, we're becoming more like Jesus Christ, that the, that the uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper... And the faith and the studying the Bible and the being part of a community all has an effect on our life. And the faith that's at the root of all that is showing itself in our behavior as we love God better, as we love the people around us better. Let me lead you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're immensely thankful. This stuff is sometimes really complicated. And so we're thankful for the sign and the seal of baptism, the sign and seal of the Lord's Supper, that gives us something tangible to hang on to, it gives us imagery that, that depicts what the gospel says, but also shows us in a tangible way what your Holy Spirit is doing deep within our hearts, deep within our lives, transforming us, making us more like Jesus Christ, making us alive. And we're so thankful, Heavenly Father, for the way that we can talk about this, think about this, study it, and we pray that as we do these things, that we can grow in faith, that we can grow more secure in our faith, and that we can help and encourage and teach one another, that we can always remind each other and teach our little ones.
that we've been set apart as your dearly loved people, part of your covenant family, part of the body of Jesus Christ himself. What a privilege. What an awesome gift. Thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. John chapter 6, or in John chapter 6, Jesus uses very similar imagery to, to talk about um, people being connected to Jesus through faith. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. All of our life now, of course, is a response of thankfulness for what God has done, and including how we use our finances. And this congregation is good at this. You're very generous. And so thank you for volunteering time. I noticed that there's a whole bunch of names on the list for Turtle Fest. Uh, we get a parking lot size space at, on uh, Broadway uh, on Saturday coming up. And some people have signed up to, to man that space for two hours. There's still a couple of blank spaces. If you can uh, volunteer time then, that would be awesome. Tomorrow, there's also time to volunteer if you're interested. Brad Fayen tells me that we're getting two truckloads of mulch that needs to be spread on our gardens. And he doesn't want to do that alone. He'd love to share that with you guys. So if you have time tomorrow morning, 10 or after that, um, come on down, and I'm sure um, he can use your help. We also get to give uh, offerings of money. The first uh, box in the hall there uh, by the table, by the door, is for Crosspoint, for our uh, general fund. And uh, it also supports, us, supports the work of our classes and the work of our denomination. The second one is for a Helping Hands Food Bank. And you may have noticed in the newsletter, if you read through that, that the Helping Hands Food Bank here in Tilsonburg has some empty shelves. And so they're looking for our help to fill those shelves. You can give financially. There's also ways you can contact our deacons about giving uh, groceries if you'd like to do it that way instead. Uh, touch base with the deacons if you're interested in that. But the second box over by the table by the door is for the Helping Hand Food Bank today. Let's rise again and we'll sing. Give thanks.
We're going to come to God in prayer now. But before we do, there's a couple things I'd like to mention. Um, Jackie Fayen has a sister named Aileen. Aileen's been sick for the last number of years uh, with cancer and uh, over the last week got uh, an awful lot more sick. And uh, our condolences to you, to you, Jackie, to your family. Uh, Aileen passed away this week and uh, the funeral won't be till mid-June. Uh, They're waiting on people to come from various places. But uh, if you get a chance, offer your condolences. Um, maybe not all in person to this morning, but online and all the usual ways of contacting people. And uh, Jerry Hogevain uh, had uh, death in his family as well. His 17-year-old grandson Joshua was in a car accident on Thursday night and passed away from that. And so uh, Jerry is understandably really torn up by that, and our condolences go to him and to his family. I don't have uh, details on that funeral either but that will be probably out in Langton at a Roman Catholic church there. Let's talk to God. Heavenly Father, death really hurts. The separation and loss, the pain and suffering of people that we love is, is really difficult to experience, to watch. And so our hearts go to those that have had losses in their families in their extended families. We pray for Jackie and for her family. Pray for Jerry Hogevain and his family. Will you be close and give comfort and reassurance and a sense of your deep, deep love? And we pray that we as a church family can be kind and generous and tactful in the way that we support people that are going through experiences of sadness and grief. May we be able to show love to our neighbor as you've shown love and compassion and care for us. Teach us how to do that well, we pray. Hear our prayer for we come in Jesus. Also this week, Afka's, uh, Afka Ipma's grandson, Chris, was hospitalized. And uh, it looks very serious. And so we'll lift uh, your son and uh, your daughter, so sorry, son-in-law and daughter and grandson in prayer as well. Heavenly Father, we're really thankful that Chris has made in your image and that he's a dearly loved child of yours. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you strengthen him, that he can get the care that he needs, and we pray that your will is done in his life. We pray for strength for his parents as they are at his bedside for long hours. May they get the rest they need, but also may they be able to make wise choices and decisions for the care of their son. We pray for all those that are affected by this kind of illness of somebody that they love and care for dearly. We pray that we can be understanding as a church family and encourage and support one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Are there other things that we should talk to God about? Reasons for thanksgiving or concerns? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Leanne um, is somebody that we know through the um, preschool drop-in, the Jack and Jill program, and uh, she's had a difficult pregnancy, and we're really thankful that her baby Elijah arrived safely this week, an answer to an awful lot of prayer. Um, she is still recovering from the, the uh, birth, but he's doing really, really well. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that Elijah could be war born healthy and, and safe. We're pre thankful for your care for Leanne and for the medical care being so readily available for her. And we pray for her husband Henry, for their children. We're really delighted alongside this family for the way that you've given them new life in their household and for the way that your promises did not fall to the ground, but you held them up and you took care of them through a long and difficulty, difficult pregnancy. Praise be to your name for the way that your glory, your care, your love shines in this situation. Heavenly Father, we recognize that there's others in our congregation and community, extended families that are expecting children. And we pray there too that as you do that mysterious and wonderful thing of knitting a child together in its mother's womb, we pray that you give strength to the couple that's expecting, the family that's expecting, and that all things can go well, and that we have chance in the fullness of time to marvel 
at your handiwork, that children can be born healthy and strong at exactly the right time, and that you sustain the parents as well. We praise your name for answered prayers. In Jesus we come. Amen. How about this? Has anybody seen this week something awesome, something amazing, that made you say, wow, God, you're so incredible? Yeah. The double rainbow. rainbow. Over this uh, week, middle of the week, we saw a whole whack of different rainbows and and storms and cloud bursts and all sorts of stuff. And uh, I was standing here in the parking lot and enormous double rainbow. I tried to take a photo. You saw, some of you saw it. It didn't work out real good, but man, it's so beautiful. And God's promises demonstrated in that rainbow that he hung up his bow in the sky and says, I'm not going to wage war on my people anymore, but I will be gracious and kind and forgive them. Uh, it takes your breath away. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your creation. We're thankful for sunshine. We're thankful for rain. We depend on those things for our gardens to grow, for flowers to grow, for our crops to grow. And we've got lots of both of that this week. And we thank you for that. And it's just amazing the way those two things combine, some mornings, some afternoons, and and we can see the brilliance of the spectrum of light as, as it gets displayed in falling rain. And sometimes it's so bright and so brilliant, it just takes our breath away. Thank you for your covenant promises. Thank you for the beauty of your creation. Thank you. Thank you for hanging up your bow and for forgiving us our sin and wrongdoing, particularly as we see that in Jesus' death and resurrection. To you be praise and glory, now and forevermore. Anything else that somebody saw this week? Yeah, Georgie. Well, I looked at my garden this morning. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that cool? That's cool. Good. Thanks, Georgie. I know um, Maravik was taking a look at the garden that she and, and uh, Mickey take care of behind our place. Uh, there's all sorts of plants growing there as well, and that food is going to eventually be donated to, for the food bank. And so thank you for your work on that, uh, Mickey and Maravik. But it's neat. You go there after the service if you don't mind wet shoes. It's kind of really neat to see there, too, uh, plants just springing out of the ground. Heavenly Father, the way that you work in creation is just so amazing. We put dead-looking seeds into the ground. And with sunshine and rain, you allow that to spring out of the ground and to dig roots down deep into the earth and to grow into these marvelous plants, plants that just delight us with the colors and the scents and the beauty. Plants that give forth different kinds of food, a whole variety of different kinds of tastes and textures and different things we can do with it as we cook them or as we slice them up into salad. It is just amazing what you've done in your creation. And we praise you and we glorify you for the way that we can count on the fact that we put a seed in the ground that that it springs up. We're thankful as well for the way that, well, that's an image of Jesus as well, that when he looked like he was completely dead, when he was physically dead, he was put into the ground. And three days later, he sprung up Lord of life, full of life, to give joy and victory and life to us through faith. We praise your holy name. Hear our prayer and answer us. In Jesus we pray. Amen. I'd like the kids to come forward. We have a song that we're going to sing together. And when the time's right, I'll ask you to stand as well. Okay. Do we have all our kids? Eleanor, do you want to come up too? Yeah, you want to come up too? Okay, Braxton, put your money in the bank. Okay. I have a question for you guys. What's a superhero? What's a superhero? Yeah. Saves people. Saves people, yeah. What's special about a superhero? They 
They saved lots of lives. They saved lots of lives. But how do they do that? They can play drums. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So superheroes sometimes can fly, like Superman, right? And sometimes, like Spider-Man, he can climb up buildings, right? Can you guys do those things? You can? Uh -huh. You can show us later, if your mom gives you permission. That's right. If there was bricks sticking out... Yeah, so there's a superhero who can do many, many things, and we're going to sing about him. Who's that superhero? God. That's God, yeah, because he's big, he's strong, and he's mighty, and there's nothing that he can't do, right? Okay, we're going to get our moms and dads to help us. We're going to do some actions. We'll give this a whirl. My God is so big, so strong, and so Matthew chapter 26, I'm picking it up in verse 17. This is during the last few days before Jesus was crucified. This is the night on which he was betrayed and arrested and then put on trial. And Jesus has been busy teaching. And now he tells his disciples this very night. No, that's not where I'm reading. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparation for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed and directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after another, Surely you don't mean me, Lord? Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Thanks be to God. So last Sunday we had a teaching sermon about baptism. And that was intentional. In two weeks, on June the 23rd, the Lord willing, we're going to celebrate with the Rolfson family when little Lauren Yana is baptized. And then a week after that, on June the 30th, the Lord willing, Irene and Joe, Cindy and Sam will publicly profess their faith here in our worship service. And as part of their profession of faith, both Joe and Sam are going to be baptized. And in that same service, take two peppermints maybe, in that same service on June the 30th, we're going to have the Lord, celebrate the Lord's Supper. We just read about that from Matthew's Gospel. how Jesus introduced the Lord's Supper as he was celebrating the Passover with his 12 disciples. If you followed the Cross Point's daily reading, daily Bible readings this week, then you read all about the Passover early in the week. The Passover in the Jewish uh, uh, tradition is an annual celebration, a reminder and celebration of how God rescued his people from Egypt. How, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, he brought them out of the land of slavery. Perhaps you recall some of the story, right? How they were captive slaves in Egypt. And they were being mistreated in Egypt. And so God used a series of ten plagues to convince Pharaoh to let God's people go. And after a couple of these uh, plagues of gnats or of water turning to blood or frogs in every single room in every single house. After a little bit, Pharaoh said, well, sure, let, let the people go. Go away. But then he would change his mind. And then God said, well, okay, then I'll have to send another plague. And the final plague, the tenth plague, was absolutely terrible. One night, in every Egyptian household, the firstborn son died. Pharaoh and all of his people were punished for their brutal, brutal oppression of the Israelites. They were punished for resisting God's command that Moses brought, saying, Let my people go. The destroyer that night went through the whole country of Egypt and visited every Egyptian household. But the Israelite households were all spared. Do you remember what the Israelites did that night so that the angel of death would pass over their household? What did they do? Blood on the doorpost, right? They slaughtered a lamb, a year-old lamb that was perfect, and then they took that blood and a hyssop branch and they painted it on the top of the door frame and on the side of the door frame and the other side of the door frame. And then they took the lamb and they, they roasted it inside. And with bread that they didn't wait for leaven to take place, they, they didn't put yeast in it so it didn't have time to rise, flat bread, like this, they, they, they ate the flat bread, they ate the roast lamb, and they stayed in that house all night long and kept vigil as God kept vigil, protecting their houses from the angel of destruction. And then from that point on, as explained in Exodus chapter 12, it was an annual celebration. They kept vigil every year at the Passover, eating roast lamb, painting blood on the doorframe of their house, eating unleavened bread, and remembering in vivid ways how God had rescued them out of Egypt and out of slavery. Well, that celebration of the Passover, that annual feast, is the foundation on which the Lord's Supper is built. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, his disciples prepared the Passover in the house of a certain man. They slaughtered the lamb. They dabbed the lamb's blood on the doorframe with a hyssop branch. 
and they made the rest of the meal ready so that they could spend the evening there eating and drinking and remembering God's mighty acts for their salvation, the salvation of God's people. It's interesting when you compare uh, the different Gospels that even more than Matthew's Gospel, the Gospel according to John highlights the connection between Jesus and the Passover lamb. Already in John chapter 1, Jesus' relative, John the Baptist, reveals Jesus' identity by saying, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's an image that stuck with John, an image that he used often. And it comes up again when John wrote the book of Revelation. He saw visions of Jesus Christ in glory. How Jesus is victorious despite all the powerful kings and all the powerful kingdoms of the world. And he had this vision in which he saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The highest point of glory and honor and respect in all of the heaven. And there is this lamb looking as if he had been slain. This is Jesus, the Passover lamb, who was slain and rose again. You see, the gospel according to John and the book of Revelation show these connections between Jesus and the Passover lamb. And so when we celebrate the supper, the Lord's Supper... It's not a sacrifice of a lamb or other, any other living animal the way that the Passover was. No blood gets shed in the Lord's Supper celebration. Instead, the bread and the cup remind us of how Jesus' body was broken and how his blood was shed so that the punishment for our sin. God's punishment on your sin, on my sin, passes over us because Jesus is the lamb that was slain in our place. His blood was shed because Jesus was the substitute. At the cross, God the Father put the punishment for all your sin on Jesus the Christ, the Passover lamb. His blood was shed and he died so that your life would be spared. And you could enjoy life in the promised land. That's the good news of the gospel. Because ever since our first parents rebelled against God in the garden so long ago, humankind has been in active rebellion every generation again in rebellion against God Most High, not obeying His commands, not obeying His instructions for holy living. I don't know how you find it in your life, but I see it in myself that I don't always live up to God's command to love him with heart, soul, mind, and strength. I don't always love my neighbor as myself. What about you? How are you doing on those things? And that becomes kind of uncomfortable because disobeying God, not living up to his standard, always carries a penalty. As the Egyptians discovered in the Ten Plagues, there's a penalty for rebellion, rebelling against God, for re resisting God's instructions. Rebelling against God always, always, always leads to death and, and separation from God most holy. The only hope that we have, like the Israelites in, Israel, in Egypt, the only hope that they had was that something else was slain and their firstborn son was spared. It's the hope that we have as well. That somebody else substitutes and takes our punishment for ourselves so that we get spared and, and can live. Eating the bread at the Lord's Supper table reminds us how Jesus was physically beaten and bloodied. How his body was nailed to the cross, how he died, and his body was buried in a tomb. But that bread also reminds us that three days later, he physically rose from the grave. Jesus died, but he lives again. The disciples afterwards, when he met with them in the, in the upper room, they could touch his hands, they could see his wounds, 
Thomas could even put his, his hand in the nail, his finger in the nail holes. This was Jesus in the flesh. And he was alive after he had died. And 40 days later, Jesus was physically lifted up to heaven. And that's where John saw him in glory, the lamb that was slain on the throne in heaven. Jesus' glorified body, alive again, is physically present in the throne room of God most holy. And so just as in baptism... Being washed with the water demonstrates how the Holy Spirit cleanses us from sin. Eating the bread connects us with the body of Jesus Christ. By faith, we die with Jesus and we're raised to life with Jesus. And the bread reminds us of that that intimate connection with Jesus, that we are one flesh with him. And so in the Lord's Supper, you're assured that what happened to Jesus also, in a way, happens to you. And so that's true about the dying, that's true about the rising, but it's also true about the glorification. In the letter to the church in Ephesus, it's written, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And so sitting at the Lord's Supper table is a reminder that we are actually sitting in glory with God Most High. We are communion with the the risen and glorified Jesus Christ. I know it's tough to imagine all that, to believe all that through the veil of these earthly elements. But that's the reality of sitting at the Lord's Supper table with Jesus as the one who is the host at the meal and who assures you that you are connected with him. His word assures you that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And so eating this bread makes the the connection between you and the body of Jesus Christ more tangible. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper unites you with Jesus and with all other believers. We are one body for we all partake in the one loaf. And so that word picture shows up in the New Testament letter to the church in Ephesus as well. God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And so this connection between faith in Jesus and life with God forever is really strong. And there's lots more that can be said about the significance of the bread. Jesus talks about this at length in John chapter 6. After feeding 5,000 men, not including women and children, from five loaves and two fish, Jesus makes a startling statement in John chapter 6. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then a little while later in this discourse, Jesus goes on to say to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. The crowds that were listening to Jesus as he taught this way almost gagged as they argued about Jesus' word. Did he really say we had to eat his flesh and drink his blood? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Uh, They aren't the only people to find this imagery of the Lord's Supper startling and off-putting. It's a stumbling block. It's a scandal. It's one of those things that caused rumors all through the whole Roman Empire as these Christians got together and celebrated the Lord's Supper together, eating the bread and drinking the cup, eating Jesus' body and drinking his blood. And yet it's hard to hear Jesus talking in John chapter 6 about eating his, blood and drinking, or eating his body and drinking his blood without thinking of the Lord's Supper. It's not what he's talking about there, but, but the imagery carries over into the Lord's Supper. He shows that connection between the bread and his body at the Last Supper when he institutes it. Because he says, while they were eating, uh, Matthew writes, Jesus took bread when he had given thanks. And we do this each time at Lord's Supper, right? He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. By faith, when we eat the bread at the Lord's Supper, 
we receive the Lord's body in the mystery of the sacrament. It assures us that all the benefits of dying with Christ and rising with Christ and being glorified with Christ are something that God gives you as you eat the bread, as you drink the cup. That's the invisible thing that the Holy Spirit does, that the bread and the cup make visible, make tangible, make a little bit more real and believable. And so the cup is also a powerful sign. Then Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Partaking in Jesus' blood is a significant action to take. It's a sacramental thing. It's a, it's a connection with, with Jesus and with his life-giving blood. You see, in the Old Testament book of Leviticus, the Lord tells his people, The life of a creature is in its blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. That's why we sing sometimes a hymn that says, There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. I don't know how the next line goes. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank you. I should have written it out. You see, when you drink the cup in the Lord's Supper, the life-giving power of Jesus' blood flows into you and makes you alive. Jesus' blood makes atonement for your life. Jesus' blood covers up your wrongdoing and allows you to share in Jesus' resurrection, allows you to share in His life. And so the cup is a visible sign of the invisible work that God the Holy Spirit does deep within us to transform us and make us alive with Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. And so at, Lord, at uh, Cross Point, we no longer use wine at the Lord's Supper, even though that's what Jesus used. Why do you think we don't use wine at the Lord's Supper? Does anybody know? Yeah. Because there's kids? No, actually, that's not the reason. In the Lord's Supper, kids are allowed to partake. I mean, that small little bit, nobody's going to get arrested for that small little bit because it's part of the sacrament and tradition of what we do as people worshiping God. So that's not, it sounds like a good reason, but that's not the reason. Anybody else have a reason? There are people in our congregation who are addicted to alcohol. And so in order not to put that smell or even the alcohol in front of somebody, we say, all of us are just going to use grape juice instead. This became really powerful and apparent to me in my first congregation. We still use wine in that, in that worship service. And so it came time to do Lord's Supper, and I took the lid off of the Lord's Supper tray that had the, the glasses of wine in it. And that smell just went through the whole sanctuary that it does, the way it does. And it's a beautiful thing. And then a man stood up from the middle of the sanctuary, and I knew instantly who he was. I knew he'd been in recovery for 20 years, had been sober for 20 years. And he said, I can't take this. I, I'm sorry, I need to leave. And, and he walked out. Because just the smell of the wine evoked the, the desire for a drink for him. And we as Cross Point didn't want to do that to people that with God's help have worked really, really hard to get in control of their alcoholism. And we kind of wanted to do that because the Lord's Supper table is a place where God's hospitality, where God's open house of mercy is on display. And we kind of figured that we needed to reflect that same generosity, that same kind of hospitality when we welcome people to eat and drink to remember and believe because all believers are invited to come to the lord's supper table so who is allowed to come to the lord's supper 
over the past couple of decades, our, our denomination has had conversations about whether or not the children of believers should participate in the Lord's Supper. They get baptized. The children of believers are baptized in the Christian Reformed denomination. Should the children of believers who are baptized, should they also come and partake in the Lord's Supper? Uh, that's been debated back and forth over the years, over the decades, over the centuries, millennia. But just like, this is where the denomination landed, just like covenant children are welcome at the Passover in the Old Testament, covenant children are welcome at the Lord's Supper table. Parents and guardians are responsible for making sure that their children understand the Lord's Supper in an age-appropriate and ability-appropriate way. So that they come to the Lord's Supper table knowing as, as much as they can what it's about and coming with age-appropriate expressions of faith. So what do you think? What does that kind of faith look like for a 45-year-old to come to the Lord's Supper table? What does it look like for a 15-year-old do you think if a five-year-old five can sing with their whole heart, Jesus loves me, this I know, do you think they have a place at the Lord's Supper table? You see, the Lord's Supper is a sacrament. Something changes in you. It's a powerful action. Something changes when you eat and drink at the Lord's Supper table. Because when we eat and we drink at the Lord's Supper table, it brings us back in time. So we stand there at the foot of the cross, we stand at the mouth of the open tomb, and you're invited to ponder Jesus' suffering. You're invited to ponder Jesus' death. You're invited to think deeply about Jesus' resurrection. You see, in the Lord's Supper, you're invited to marvel at how by faith you get included in what Jesus Christ has done. You get included in Jesus dying. You get included in Jesus' resurrection. You get included in Jesus' glorification and life forevermore. You're part of the body of Christ. You're part of the family of God. You're a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. It also has an effect in the present. Because in the present, the Lord's Supper connects you with Jesus. He is in glory, but he's also, through his spirit and through faith, he's here with us at the, supper, at the Lord's Supper celebration. And we're connected by eating the bread, connects us with his body. By drinking his, his, the, the cup, it connects us with the blood of Jesus Christ. You're united with Jesus Christ by faith as you eat and as you drink. But you're also united with the people that share the meal with you. Those in this room, to be sure, but also with a church of God of all time and all places, through all the generations that ever have lived and had faith in God, and all the generations that are still to come, that by God's grace will come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Celebrating, eating, and drinking together connects us as the body of Jesus Christ, as the bride of Jesus Christ. And that's why often, if there's people who aren't able to make it to the service because of illness or because they're hospitalized, often the elders and I will go after the service or later on in the week and we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper with that individual and often with their family as well. A way to remind them, a way to remind us that we're still connected by faith even if illness keeps us away. If you ever find yourself in that situation, please let us know and we will come visit and celebrate communion with you every time that the congregation celebrates communion as well. That's the present. We talked about the past. But the Lord's Supper gives us a taste of the future. And we've alluded to that already. Because the bread and the cup are an appetizer for this wedding feast, the wedding banquet. Jesus Christ is getting married. And you are the bride of Jesus Christ. And he is so delighted that he gets to share this feast because he's finally in the new creation, united with his bride, and they will live happily ever afterwards. You will live happily ever afterwards. You get to see God most holy 
face to face. You get to see people from all generations and sit down and hang out for a while with King David. Break bread with John the Baptist. And whatever other favorite hero of faith you can think of, you get to talk to them. And those that didn't become famous, you'll find beautiful people in glory the way we found beautiful people in our congregation as well. And that day is coming. And this is the foretaste, the appetizer, to sharpen your appetite so that you just can't wait for that day to come when Christ returns in all of his glory and everybody who's ever had faith will have a seat at the table. Man, what a reunion. And we get to celebrate breaking bread together and drinking the cup together in glory. Won't that be the day? The Lord's Supper brings us to the past, to the foot of the cross, to the open grave. It connects us with Jesus Christ and with each other in the present. And it is a promise and assurance of what is to come. The Lord has given his word and he will do it. Because the day is coming when we'll have that feast that, describes, that gets described in the book of Revelation. I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and loud peals of thunder shouting, Alleluia! For the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. That's you. You are the dearly loved bride of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen? Yeah. Let's talk to God. Heavenly Father, that you give us so much and through a bit of bread and a thimble full of juice is incredible. We're thankful for your incredible covenant promises. We're thankful for the covenant reality of Jesus' death and resurrection to atone for our sin, to make us right with you, to make us holy, to give us life everlasting with you and for you and with each other. We're so thankful. And so we're looking forward to to the celebration that we have on June 30th with the Lord's Supper and baptisms. But we're also looking forward to the day when, well, when we no longer see through a veil dimly, but that we see you face to face and we experience the reality of all these promises. May that day come soon. In the meantime, strengthen our faith as we read scripture and as we pray, as we use the sacraments and experience the sacraments as as a church family, strengthen our faith so that when Christ returns, he does find that we are faithful on the earth. Or, if you call us home before Jesus Christ returns, that we have the privilege of seeing you face to face and waiting for that day with you in glory. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus we pray. Amen. We're going to sing. Let's stand and sing Meekness and Majesty. Oh,
People loved by God, lift up your hearts to receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you shalom. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. Singing this in two parts, the men can follow me with the first part and the women can follow Connie with the second. <laughs> smile and chuckle because he's our pastor and when he walked in a little bit earlier he said I'm on fire today <laughs> he said that to an elder and I thought to myself I hope it's a burning bush because if he burns out it's not good <laughs> we had prayers for the community and he prayed for the community I would like to invite the community Cross Point community to join with me as we pray for him. Before we do that, I definitely appreciated two sermons that were teaching sermons. He talked about tradition in the Old Testament. Tradition in the Christian Reformed Church over the years, we had two services. I can remember going to four, all on one Sunday, because my dad was an elder. But the second service, whether it was in the afternoon or the evening, was always a teaching sermon. It could be on the Heidelberg Catechism or the Canons of Dort. Later on, it was on the Contemporary Testimony. We're now down or up to one service a day, and I thank you for two teaching sermons. And you know what? Tomorrow he starts a week off, and he's not going to be here next Sunday. So I thought it'd be appropriate that we thank you for that, and now we will pray for you. Heavenly Father, we as a community come before you and we thank you that after your son died, the disciples became apostles and began to preach and teach. And as your church flourished, then people were appointed to be pastors. And we thank you, Lord, that Harold has been our pastor for going on almost seven years, and it keeps on going, it's almost eight. 
And we thank you, Lord, for the work that he has been able to do with us within our congregation, within our community, and for our congregation, and for our community. We thank you for the help that he, he has been given through his wife and family, and all those that account him as friends and support him from day to day. And we ask you, Lord, that in this coming week, when he has a vacation, he may be strengthened and then come back with us to lead with two more services that will be special as well. And we thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that he has given us, and we pray for your blessing on him today, tomorrow, and for the rest of his ministry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.